Good evening aspirants, welcome to the Hindu News Analysis by Shankar AS Academy for the date 31st of July 2023. Displayed here are the list of news articles we will be going through today. Today I have covered articles from both today's newspaper and yesterday's newspaper. Now without wasting time, let's start today's discussion. Look at this news article. This news article talks about the Cinematograph Amendment Bill 2023. The bill brought about certain changes. For example, the bill has introduced new graded age rating for movies. This rating system will help parents decide whether to let their children watch a film unaccompanied or not. Like this, the bill made many changes. But what has not changed is that the CBFC, that is the Central Board of Film Certification, which should have been a mere classification or certification body, will continue to remain a censoring body. That is, rather than issuing certificate to the movie, the CBFC will continue to cut and chop the movies in the name of censor. This is about the news article given here. In this context, let us go through some of the important provisions of the bill. Firstly, know that the bill seeks to amend the Cinematograph Act of 1952. The CBFC is constituted under this act only. This board certifies films for exhibition. Such certification may be subject to modification or deletion. The CBFC may also refuse the exhibition of any film. The bill did not introduce any changes in the powers regarding the CBFC, which is the main point of contention in the amendment. This is what I mentioned earlier. Let me explain you with a simple example. Say a movie contains nudity and bad words. The CBFC will issue a certificate and in addition to this, the CBFC will also censor the swear words or the bad words and the nudity portions. That is, it will continue to act as a censoring body in addition to acting as a certification body. This is the first important provision of the amendment bill. Secondly, the bill substitutes UA certificate into three other certificates to indicate age appropriateness. The categories include UA 7 plus, UA 13 plus and UA 16 plus. This means that children younger than the given age limit can access such movies with parental guidance alone. This is in line with Sham Benegal Committee 2017 recommendations. Moving on, thirdly, a separate certificate for television or other media has been introduced. Mainly, films with A certificate or S certificate will require separate certificate for exhibition on television or any other media that is prescribed by the central government. The CBFC may also direct the applicant to carry out necessary modification or deletion for the separate certificate so that it can be telecasted in the television. This is the third important provision. Lastly and most importantly, the bill prohibits carrying out the unauthorized recording and unauthorized exhibition of films in order to stop piracy. According to the bill, attempting an unauthorized recording will also be an offence. Here, an unauthorized recording means infringing copy of a film at a licensed place of film exhibition without the owner's authorization. In simple words, Recording film during film exhibition in theatres and uh, transmitting or distributing them for profit or any other unauthorized purpose has been made a punishable offence under the bill. That is, sharing or selling videos recorded from movie theatres has been made a punishable offence. This is done mainly to curb piracy. See, this has been mainly introduced because the film industry is facing a loss of rupees 20,000 crore annually because of piracy. This is why such arrangements has been made. The above offence will be punished with imprisonment between 3 months and 3 years and a fine between 3 lakhs or 5% of the total production cost of the film. This is the punishment provision provided in the new amendment bill. These are some important provisions of the amendment bill. With this, let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article. Now, take a look at this news article. Recently, the Supreme Court directed two activists namely Vernon Gonzalez and Arun Ferreira to pair their mobile phones with the National Investigation Agency probe offices. Now, why did the Supreme Court do this? Earlier, these two activists were arrested by the NIA in the Bhima Koregon case. 
Subsequently, the activist sought bail before the Supreme Court. While granting bail to them, the Supreme Court imposed certain conditions. The court said the activists have to enable their location status in their mobile phones for 24 hours a day. Apart from this, their phone should also be paired with an investigation officer of the NIA. This enables the investigation officer to identify the exact location of the activist. So, some people say that the direction of the Supreme Court is violating the fundamental right to personal liberty, life and privacy. This is all about the news. Since the news article here talks about bail, now is a right time for us to revise about bail and the types of bail. Let us start the discussion first by understanding what is bail. Bail is taken from the French word bailer. Bailer means to deliver or to hand over. Basically, the term bail refers to the temporary release of an accused person from legal custody. In other words, bail denotes the provisional release of an accused whose trial is pending and the court is yet to announce the judgment. See, in judicial terms, the term bail means the security amount that is deposited in order to secure the release of an accused. Note that the bail is regulated by the Code of Criminal Procedure, that is CRPC. Under the CRPC, bail can be granted to the accused person either by a police officer or a judicial magistrate. The main motive behind the bail is to secure presence of an accused person at trial and to protect the liberty of the accused person while they are awaiting trial. Okay? Now, with this information, let us look up the types of the bail. Generally, there are four types of bail in India. They include regular bail, interim bail, anticipatory bail and statutory bail. Now, we will look at these types one by one. First, let us take regular bail. Regular bail is issued to an individual who has been arrested and detained by the police. To put it in simple words, regular bail refers to the temporary release of an accused person from the police jail to ensure his attendance at the trial. Now, let us take interim bail. See, the interim bail is issued for a short period. It is granted to an accused before the hearing of a regular or anticipatory bail. Then comes anticipatory bail. See, a person can seek anticipatory bail if such person suspects that he may be arrested for a non-bailable offence. This means that a person can seek anticipatory bail before he gets arrested by the police. So, if an individual has been granted anticipatory bail by the court, he cannot be arrested by the police. Finally, let us see a few points about the statutory bail. Note that the statutory bail is also known as default bail. The statutory bail is given when the police or the investigation agency fails to file a report within a certain time frame. See, these are the four types of bail. And uh, that is all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw what is bail and the types of bail. Now, let us conclude this and take up the next news article. Take a look at this FAQ article. This article is speaking about different aspects of human challenge studies. Here the term human challenge studies refers to the studies in which human beings are deliberately exposed to studies. This practice will help the researchers to learn more about the diseases. Now, why is this topic human challenge studies suddenly in news? See, recently, that is on 17th July, the Indian Council of Medical Research posted the consensus policy statement for human challenge studies in India. The statement has been posted on the ICMR website for the public consultation for a period of about one month. Because of this only, the topic human challenge studies appeared in the news today. See, this article speaks about the importance of human challenge studies, then about the difference between traditional clinical trials and the human challenge studies, and finally, about the challenges surrounding human challenge studies in India. So, in our discussion, we will understand all these points in detail. Okay? Before getting into the discussion, the syllabus regarding this discussion is highlighted here. You can go through it. Now, let us start with human challenge studies. As we saw earlier, the human challenge studies refers to the studies in which human beings are deliberately exposed to a particular disease. 
and this practice will help the researchers to learn more about the disease for example let us consider a person a and he is deliberately exposed to covid virus as person a is exposed to covid virus he gets various symptoms and health complications this will help the researchers to understand the progress and the severity of a disease like covid so we can say that in the human challenge studies it will help to better understand any particular disease okay note that india has not undertaken human challenge studies before see in india the disease burden from infectious disease is significantly high and the mortality rate from such infectious disease stood at 30% in india apart from this india is also continuously encountering various infectious disease year by year because of this reason the importance of human challenge studies was felt by the indian government so recently the icmr posted a consensus policy statement for human challenge studies in india so we have to wait for future updates regarding the policy for human challenge studies in india now moving forward let us understand the importance of human challenge studies firstly human challenge studies help us to understand various aspects of infectious microbes and the disease caused by such microbes secondly human challenge studies will speed up the process of finding a safe and effective drug or vaccine for various infectious diseases thirdly the study will provide better information about multiple aspects of disease like pathogens infection transmission and prevention and finally human challenge studies will supplement the traditional clinical trials as we saw earlier india has not undertaken human challenge studies before as of now india is relying on traditional clinical trials to understand about a particular disease so if india undertakes human challenge studies it will supplement the traditional clinical trials and it will also help us to find a more effective medical interventions this is all about the importance of the human challenge studies now moving on let us see the difference between the traditional clinical trials and human challenge studies the first major difference lies in the nature of exposure to pathogens see the participants in traditional clinical trials are strongly advised to adopt and adhere to safety measures this is to avoid getting infected with the disease but if we take the human challenge studies the participants are deliberately exposed to disease causing pathogens this is the first difference now coming to the second difference the second difference lies in the purpose see the traditional clinical trials are undertaken to study the safety and the efficacy of the drugs and vaccines but human challenge studies are carried out to understand various aspects of the infectious studies it also help us to understand and develop drugs and vaccine for the studies this is the second difference now coming to the final difference as we saw earlier in the human challenge studies the participants are deliberately exposed to disease causing pathogens so generally there is no safety in conducting human challenge studies because of this fact the human challenge studies are often undertaken to study less deadly diseases like influenza dengue typhoid cholera and malaria but if we take traditional clinical trials the participants are strongly advised to take safety measures so the traditional clinical trials will help us understand about the deadly diseases like sars cov okay this is all about the difference between the two studies now finally let us see the challenges surrounding human challenge studies in india as we saw just now the participants in the human challenge trial are deliberately exposed to disease causing pathogens this fact makes the study more challenging now coming to icmr's consensus policy statement see the icmr consensus statement has clearly mentioned that only healthy individuals in the 18 to 45 year age bracket are to be enrolled for human challenge studies the statement also clearly mentioned that children and women who are pregnant or lactating will not be enrolled for human challenge studies in addition to this the statement also mentions that the participants with pre existing medical conditions are to be excluded from the human challenge studies here comes the problem 
see most of the people are unaware of such medical conditions so if they are enrolled for human challenge studies the impacts will be severe so it is essential to carry out detailed medical examination of the participants before enrollment now coming back to the consensus statement of the icmr see the participants of the human challenge studies have to be paid with some money right see the consensus statement stated that information on payment for participants should be mentioned in the consent form but there is one condition see the statement mentioned that the exact amount of payment for participation is to be revealed only after the volunteer has consented to the participation this also creates a problem see the participants are risking their lives for human challenge studies but there is no clear cut information about the payment mechanism so the government has to amend the policy statement to include a clear cut provisions on payment and participation of human challenge studies and that is all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw what is human challenge studies we saw the difference between human challenge studies and the traditional clinical trials and finally we saw the challenges associated with human challenge studies in india now with this let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article look at this article this article talks about cell free dna according to the article cell free dna can be used for non invasive prenatal testing which helps to screen fetuses for specific chromosomal abnormalities this is about the article given here in this context let us quickly go through some of the points related to cell free dna see in the human body most of the dna in a genome is neatly packed inside the cells these dna are protected from degradation with the help of specific proteins but in some cases some fragments of dna are released from their containers and are present outside the cell they are present in the body fluids these small fragments of nucleic acid is widely known as cell free dna or cf dna now moving forward let us see how this was discovered see scientists have been aware of such degraded fragments of nucleic acid in body fluids since 1948 but only in recent times that is since the genome sequencing technology advanced the cf dna technology gained prominence because the sequencing became more accessible this is how the cf dna technology has prospered in recent times remember cf dna can be generated and released from a cell in a number of possible situation for example when a cell is dying and the nucleic acid become degraded the cf dna can occur apart from this in a variety of process cf dna can also occur for example processes those required for normal development those related to development of certain cancers and those associated with several other diseases cf dna can occur these are the possible scenario that uh, leads to the presence of cf dna in our body fluids okay finally let us quickly go through some of the applications of cf dna the first application is non invasive prenatal testing and diagnostics to carry out this test a few milliliters of blood is obtained from the mother after 9 or 10 weeks of pregnancy using genome sequencing approaches scientist will sequence the cf dna fragments that looks similar to the fetal dna this cf dna fragments can be used to understand specific chromosomal abnormalities this helps to ensure that the developing fetus is free from chromosomal abnormalities like down syndrome okay see earlier that is before the cf dna technology became widely available screening for such abnormalities would have required inserting a fine needle into the body of the pregnant mother to retrieve the amniotic fluid and the cells covering the developing fetus this is then analyzed in the lab see this method carries risk to both the fetus and the mother so cf dna based approach has now become a norm for screening high risk pregnancy this is the first major application of cf dna technology another emerging application of cf dna is that it helps in early detection diagnosis and treatment of cancer nextly 
த சிஎஃப்டிஎன்ஏ டெக்னாலஜி ஹெல்ப்ஸ் இன் அண்டர்ஸ்டாண்டிங் ஒய் யர் பாடி இஸ் ரிஜெக்டிங் அ டிரான்ஸ்பிளான்டட் ஆர்கன் ஹியர் சிஎஃப்டிஎன்ஏ சர்வ்ஸ் அஸ் அ பயோ மார்க்கர் அண்ட் இட் இஸ் கேப்பபிள் ஆஃப் சென்டிங் அ சிக்னல் ஏர்லியர் தென் அதர் மார்க்கர்ஸ் இஃப் சம்திங் ராங் இஸ் கோயிங் டு ஹேப்பன் ஹியர் வாட் இஸ் அ பயோ மார்க்கர் In simple words, a biomarker is like a clue or a signal in your body that doctors and scientists can use to understand your health. For example, a simple blood test can reveal several biomarkers that tell you whether you have diabetes or risk of heart disease. This is about biomarkers. Now moving forward, the last major application of CFDNA is that it could also act as biomarkers for neurological diseases like alzheimer's disease neuronal tumors strokes traumatic brain injury and even metabolic disorders like type 2 diabetes and fatty liver disease these are the possible applications of cfdna technology so in a true sense cfdna genomic technology promises to set us to a path of more effective disease screening and early diagnosis and this in turn will help us develop a healthy world okay so that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw what is cfdna then we saw how it was discovered after that we saw how cfdna occurs in the body fluids and finally we saw the applications of cfdna technology now with this let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article now have a look at this article this article provides a overview of indian government's measure to support the domestic chip industry it gives us an overview of the semiconductor industry the article also discusses the challenges that the indian chip industry faces this is about the article given here in our discussion today let us see some of the important points mentioned in this article first let us see why the chip industry is important for india The global demand for semiconductors is expected to grow significantly in the coming years due to the rise of new technologies such as artificial intelligence, 5G and the internet of things. India has all the necessary ingredients to become a major player in the global semiconductor industry as it has strong talent pool and great demand for semiconductors. India is a major hub for semiconductor design because 20% of the world's semiconductor design engineers are Indians. Okay? Now let us see what are the steps taken by the government to aid the domestic chip industry. See in 2021 the Indian government launched the Design Linked Incentive Scheme. This scheme provides financial support to domestic chip design companies and aims to indigenize the innovations in the domestic semiconductor design industry. The goal is to create at least 20 companies in India with a turnover of more than 1500 crores in the next 5 years. The design linked incentive scheme is open to Indian companies, startups and MSMEs. To be eligible for this scheme, companies must have at least 50% of their employees as Indian nationals and must have a registered office in India. Another important thing to note is that recently the Indian government said that it would have a equity stake in the domestic chip making companies. When a government has a equity stake in a company, it means that the government will own a portion of the company's share. The reason is to support strategic industries. The government aims to ensure a stable ecosystem by building fabless companies. Here the fabless companies simply mean the companies that design chips but outsource the manufacturing. Okay? Note that the semiconductor industry is capital intensive and requires a long term strategy. According to experts, government's attempt to invest in the shares of chip companies is likely to be ineffective and inefficient. But still, this equity infusion or the cash infusion by the government will be encouraging for the local, small and medium sized companies. Even though the government is taking many steps to strengthen the chip industry, there are some challenges faced by these companies. First important challenge is lack of venture capitalist. There are very few venture capitalists in India from the private sector who mainly focus on the semiconductor industry. Secondly, the cost of designing a chip is very high and this can be a barrier for new companies entering into the market despite this high cost of designing the annual revenue of domestic chip design companies is estimated to be only 150 crores this is very low revenue compared to the potential of india's talent and demand finally 
the higher gestation period in chip industry is a major challenge for it here gestation period refers to the time taken to develop and bring new chip into the market this period can be quite long often taking several years because of the complexity involved in chip designing due to this reason chip companies are not able to attract potential investors and venture capitalist into the industry like the software industry does these are the important challenges faced by the domestic chip industries so that is all regarding this discussion in this discussion first we saw an overview of india's domestic chip industry then we saw the steps taken by the government and finally we saw the challenges faced by the chip industry and with this we have come to the end of the news article discussion session now let us take up the practice prelims questions we have four practice prelims questions today let us see them one by one let us take up the first question let me read out the question it is a type of bail that can be granted to an accused person when the police or the investigation agency fails to submit its report about the accused person within a certain time period which type of bail is mentioned here from our discussion we know that the correct answer here is option c default bail moving on to the next question see here three countries are given the countries are mali burkina faso and zimbabwe we have to find why these countries caught the international attention in the recent years see the correct answer here is option d successful coups all three countries mentioned here that is mali burkina faso and zimbabwe witnessed successful military coups okay this is about this question now moving on to the next question here four statements are given we have to find which among the following is the primary objective of the central board of film certification from our discussion we know that the correct answer here is option c classifying films based on their content for appropriate audience this is the primary objective of central board of film certification now moving on to the last question see this is a quiz question for you and the question is based on our cell free dna discussion interested aspirants can post the answer for this question in the comment section the main questions based on today's discussion are displayed here interested aspirants can write the answers for the questions in the comment section if you like today's video like comment and share it with your friends for more updates regarding upsc preparation subscribe to shankar ais academy's youtube channel thank you for listening